Butterflies are truly one of God's gift of nature. A creature that sports brilliant colors, flutters around gracefully, and dines only on the nectar provided by beautiful flowers. But there's one butterfly that has more provocative tastes in cuisine. The Purple Emperor isn't as devoted to its sweet tooth as its king. With utter irony, the stink of death attracts a sheet of this insect's indigo wings to descend. But the juxtaposition of beauty and decay is common in life, death, and taxonomy. Welcome back to Life, Death, and Taxonomy. Enjoy 30 minutes of interesting animal information. I'm Joe. And I'm Carlos. Thank you to Cassie for the creation of our theme song. To hear more of Cassie's music, please search Cassie Michelle on YouTube or Spotify. And thank you to Johanna for the creation of this week's artwork. To check that out, you can visit us at our home on the web at ldtaxonomy.com. And a very special thank you to our patrons, to uh, Jesse Raspolich, Carol Raspolich, and... Richard Kaspar, thank you so much for your support. It's greatly appreciated. Thanks for helping us keep the lights on. And today we're talking about something with a name that sounds like it could be a fish, a bird, or a flower. But more on that later. Yeah, I I did not know what this was. And then I saw the binomial nomenclature and I still didn't know what this was. <laughs> but we are talking about the purple emperor it also sounds like it could be a street drug like yeah. a like a pill it's like oh you getting the perps you getting the purple emperor purple emperor those things take you to the moon <laughs> that's what the, that's what the kids say these days um yeah the purple emperor also known as rusco get it mm. uh violet spar Good. It's purple. And uh, carry on my wayward spun. Or carry on <laughs> my wayward spun. But yeah. You ready to taxonomize this bad boy? Yeah. This should, this should give you an idea of what kind of animal this is. Mm -hmm. The kingdom is Animalia. There you go. What is it? It's an animal. You d <laughs> I did it. <laughs> Very, very informative. The phylum is Arthropoda. All right, so it's definitely uh, not a, a fish or a bird um, or a drug. The class is Insecta. Uh, get closer. The order is Lepidoptera. And Here I, we and are. At this point, I, we've lost everyone, including myself. This is butterflies. Um, the family is Nymphalidae. The genus is Apatura, Apatura, and the species is Iris. Apatura, Iris. If everything is made to be broken, I just want you to know what I, who I am, what I am. I forgot how that song goes. <laughs> who I am. That's how it goes. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I was like, what song is that? Don't see me. Uh, the guy needs to enunciate. But since we're in the business of naming things, it's time for my favorite part of the show. Cue the music. C -c 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 Critter groups. The part of the show where I ask you, Joe, a question. And that question is the same every time. What is the name of a group of this animal? animal or what is the term of entry? Or what is the collective noun if you saw a group of butterflies uh after picking your jaw up off the floor would you call it a a kaleidoscope of butterflies b a tempest of butterflies c a column of butterflies or d an iridescence of butterflies iridescence was a word on the wikipedia page so i'm gonna eliminate that one Tempest sounds really... What was the first one? Kaleidoscope. I want to say a Tempest. Final answer. That is incorrect. The answer was A. Kaleidoscope. Kaleidoscope. That one is the most appropriate. 
yeah it does it's definitely a very very good term of venery there's a um i say this i actually see and say this word all the time because it is in the pout pout fish book the the squid says hi mr fish you kaleidoscope of mope how about a <laughs> smile a little joy a little hope and um one the voice i do for the squid is an irish voice so uh i just whenever i read this it's kaleidoscope <laughs> <laughs> Oi, Mr. Fish, you kaleidoscope of mope. How about a smile, a little joy, a little hope? <laughs> Dumb Irish squid. Um, I'm going insane, is what I'm trying to say. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, but yeah, kaleidoscope. Kaleidoscope of butterflies. Enjoy. Are you ready to hear about what this thing looks like? Would you like this described to your ears? Sure. All right. So the purple emperor butterfly is a mid-sized butterfly with dark brown wings modeled with white spots and bands. There is a small orange ring on each of the lower wings. So if you know about butterflies, they have they actually have four wings, two uppers and then two lowers. They're smaller. Um, and on the back side, when you're looking down at the butterfly, these orange rings are located on the two lower wings, um, and they they kind of look like eyes. Like a lot of uh, a lot of butterflies have that look at my giant eyes kind of <laughs> markings on their wings. Um, under underneath their wings have even bigger eye spots, um, and the the parts that are white are 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 more pronounced. Um, what gives them their name is that males have a purple iridescence. Um, so, yeah, it's got that. Uh, it's got that grape drink on mm -hmm. the wing, on, on a wing, and a prayer. Um, as caterpillars, they are green with white bands. Uh, these bands mimic the veins on the leaf, so it looks very much like a. You roll the leaf up. Uh, not making a drug reference there because we've already made one drug joke. Um, they have two horns and are covered with tiny white, you know, uh, chitinous hairs. And uh, but these caterpillars turn brown in the winter because the leaves around them turn brown. So they want to. If you want to blend in, you don't want to be green in the winter. No, um, you want to be experienced. Right, you you don't want to be green as grass. You want to be brown as a professional. <laughs> <laughs> professional, as green as grass and professional brown. Um, but yeah, so mid-sized butterfly. It's not. It's it's not uh, the the moonlight butterfly. It's not going to shoot magic at you. Um, it's not the size of a of an Apache helicopter like it is in Dark Souls. But it's also not the smallest butterfly ever. But how big is it? Great question. Welcome to the Blood Measure Up segment, the official listener's favorite part of the show, the part of the show when we present the animal size and dimensions in relatable terms through a quiz that's fun for the whole family. It's also part of the sh show that's introduced by you when you send it out of yourself, saying, saying you're chattering the words measure up into LD tax on me at gmail.com. We, we do have a new Measure Up intro this week from Nora, nice. and more specifically from Lily. Noise, double noise. Uh, let's see, Nora, um, long time listener and friend of the show. My daughter Lily, who is hard of hard of hearing, but enjoys when I tell her about the animals after I listen to them. Uh, sent she sent in a recording, so we're gonna hear that. Also, I don't know how young she is or if she would care but there is a full transcript of our episodes well not an exact transcript but our, our notes and usually what we pretty close to what we talk about unless we go off of meandering which we um, never do on the on the website ldtaxonomy.com and there's videos on youtube with probably not too accurate but decent um, closed captioning closed captioning yeah uh, I'm sure that's going to get better and better as AI gets better and better. 
I hope so because I have to do it for work. Um, and editing closed captioning is a is a is a bear. <laughs> Uh, but, th- uh, let's, let's, without further ado, the listener's favorite part of the show. Up. Classic. Salt. Could you hear that? i it, it sounds like you turned it up halfway through. Let me go again. Up. Yeah. Solid. It's clear. Well enunciated well enunciated indeed (laughs) Uh, Indeed. interestingly enough uh we we my wife and i just had our our third uh child it's a girl and i was pushing for the name lily uh we but uh my wife gets to name the girls so we named her melody which is also a very nice name but my my uh input was lily so it's a it's a good name it is a good lily is a good name it like this butterfly sounds like a flower it's very appropriate yep it all works it all works together well thank you lily and thank you nora for uh um being the sound engineer on that uh wonderful recording yes thank you for putting the team on your shoulders once again that's right she actually sent this in a while ago but i forgot about it last week we, we could have done it last week Shame. But last week we had technical difficulties and there was no video. So this is a better episode to be on anyway. True, true. Uh, let's go, let's get into male wingspan. They are 70 to 80 millimeters or 2.8 to 3.1 inches. How many male butterfly wingspans go into the effective firing range of the M1 Garand? The two. 2.1 inches, you said? 3.1 inches. 3.1 inches. Okay, got it. Firing range of the M1 Grand. There we there we actually have some World War II uh, stuff. And it combines guns and World War II. The two things. I'm yeah. Currently well, in. here's a hint. The M1 Grand was the premier semi-automatic rifle used by Allied troops in World War II and around 5.4 million were made for that conflict alone. It was a standard rifle in all branches of U.S. military in an age when the average German infantryman had a slower-firing bolt-action rifle. Yeah, they had a Car 97 or something like that. uh Uh-huh. The fact that the common soldier uh, was equipped with more firepower than the common enemy made the Garand an excellent weapon in World War II. According to General George S. Patton, it was the greatest battle implement ever devised. I, I'm going to go, I have, I, I feel like many people would disagree with that. He hadn't, he hadn't known about the bomb yet, maybe. <laughs> yeah, the bomb's a big one. Planes are a big one. Um... He did know about planes. They really changed things up. Well, like tanks, are, are I'm sure. Vehicles um, in general. I'm sure from a an old Ra- time radio man. Think about <laughs> how what how radio changed warfare. But I, I think like um, submarines, radar. There's radio, so many technology. I don't know influence. radio. Radio killed the drum and fife player battalions you know <laughs> that's not fun <laughs> if, if those uh that that enviable position of the piccolo <laughs> the war piccolo the war fife the the i although i i think like the fact what we're talking about with the garand is the fact that like we've developed a gun that is Better than what the enemy has, and we mass produced it. It's mass producible. Yeah, we made our average guy better than your average guy. So that's pretty great. It's pretty grand. Yeah. Um. So the if I remember right, the M1 Grand is a thirty odd six, which is a really large and high powered rifle round that you would use to like hunt elk. 
in modern <laughs> modern times. I've fought a th I've, I've I've fought one. I I punched a thirty odd six in the face it, cause, because it disrespected me and my clan. Uh, no, I've <laughs> shot a thirty odd six in Boy Scouts, and I even uh, made my own round with bullet and gunpowder and shell and primer and all that stuff, which was fun. Um, but I uh, so it's effective range. It, it I do I would like to fire an M1 Garand at one point. It seems fun, especially when you finish the chamber and it makes the ping sound. Yeah, I want to hear that typewriter. I mean, you finish like, the, uh, yeah, yeah. I want to I want to hear in real life what I've heard so many times in all the World War Two video games I played as a kid. Yes. Um, it's funny when you play those World War Two video games. The German ca bolt action car is a lot more powerful than the Grand, even though they fired the same cartridge. Uh, but just the M1 Grand fired it faster. <laughs> or I think they fired. Uh, the, I'm pretty sure they fired the same cartridge. Um, but you know, in, yes, in video, it is thirty odd six. By the way, in video games, you have to if you, if a gun is slower, it has to be more powerful. Otherwise, no one would use it. Um, a thousand yards, three thousand feet. Nah. Yeah, I'm. A thousand is a lot. You said effective range. Yes. It may be that may be too much. I'm going to say 700 yards. Which puts us at 2,100 feet. Now, effective firing range, does that refer to, like... That refers to the distance the, the, the round will travel and still be deadly? No, I think it's... I think it's the, the distance that you can get you can have reliable accuracy at oh well, okay because i mean to increase a gun's effect it, with your definition to increase its firing range you just need to aim, aim it up because it's deadly until it hits the ground and so by aiming it up it'll take longer to hit not, the ground and go further isn't that not true like it, can't you fight like if you fire 22 if you're far enough away won't it just bounce off your chest um, it loses velocity. Yeah, it loses velocity. It starts to tumble and stuff like that, but not a thirty odd six round. I I guess like eventually, depending on the if the round is small enough, it can be not dangerous at a certain uh, at a certain distance. But to increase its range, you just need to make it stay in the air for longer. I'm going to say 8,000 8, butterflies is the is the effective range of the Grand. Final answer? Yeah. Final Grancer? Grancer, yeah. Correct Grancer was 5,712. Ah, so it's like, f what is it, like a 400 yards? 500 yards, 457 500. meters. Even that, I was thinking, like, that's kind of a long time. Like, think about, like, firing a gun the length of even one football field. Yeah, but then you put a scope on it, and then suddenly it becomes not as big of an issue. True, true. I just I just know that at the gun range that I go to, the furthest distance is 200 yards. And the guys who have, like, actual hunting rifles, it's, it's not a problem at all for them. Especially, gotcha. and if you have optics on it, but like if if you just have iron sights on an AR-15 or something like that, it's it's tough to hit stuff at 200 yards. Interesting. 500 yards though is pretty good. Pretty good for a standard issue rifle, huh? In World War II, you can hit a lot of krauts with that from very far away. Can I say uh, krauts? Is that or is that uh is is that not PC? I don't I, think you'd want to call someone a kraut today, but like can I that's call them just Jerry? a term from World War II, I think. Kraut. Can you say kraut? Sauerkraut. 
Is that it's just fine. Rommel? <laughs> He's just a sauerkraut. <laughs> Can you <laughs> say kraut? Google. Can you can you ask the, uh, the can you ask the um kraut is a German word for cabbage. So we were just like, oh, <laughs> the, in the the you like uh, Allied soldiers were just like, they eat sauerkraut, they eat cabbage. We're gonna call them cabbage. Yeah, they they called the French frogs because they eat frogs. Because they eat frogs, I guess. And I guess they called the British toast. <laughs> yeah, and they should Toasties. beans on toast. Be <laughs> We're gonna go join the beans on toast and the maple syrups. To and, the and we could have been called the hot dogs or we the burgers. We could have been called the hamburgers. <laughs> we could have been called the cheese whiz. That would have been great. All right, give me another one. I was not. That was not a nursing school victory. Okay, let's talk about female wingspan. They're slightly bigger, at eight eighty to ninety two millimeters or three point six inches. How many female purple emperors go in? Uh, uh, I could have just said a purple empress. Go into the length of the English longbow. Oh, now we're we're going we're going the way back machine. Yeah. Here's a hint. The English longbow was predominantly used in the Hundred Years' War in the late or in the 14th and 15th centuries. It's long range up to it's up to 1000 yards. So it's better than the M1 Garand. <laughs> uh, it's long range gave the English an advantage in ranged combat. And its draw weight was around 150 to 180 pounds. Can you imagine successfully hitting something at a thousand yards? Did you say a thousand yards? Yes. But at that's like you. Three thousand the air feet at a crowd. Away. Yeah. You're and just on some ramparts, shooting into the distance at a bunch of enemy soldiers. Yeah, you, you, I mean, just shooting directly, or not directly, but a, like a what a ninety-two degree angle, <laughs> like just barely off of the of straight up, and eventually and imagine it will come down <laughs> when with just its terminal velocity kill somebody. <laughs> and imagine you are a French soldier on the wall and you shoot into the enemy camp and you kill the king of england and then they flay you for it is that what happened and that that's what happened to king richard the third uh the lionheart the first man flaying. but that wasn't a longbow that was probably a crossbow or something i wonder what the french ate back then i wonder what they called them um okay mutton yeah m mead and mutton I'm going to say five feet is the length of this bow. So 16. 16 butterflies. Final answer? Yes. The correct answer is 20. So this is like a six foot bow? Yep. The bow that. had an average length of around six feet or 1.8 meters. That is a nursing school victory, exactly. Congratulations. <laughs> you can be a nurse. I uh, I was distracted because I was looking up uh, if when the crossbow was invented. Because I was like, uh, Richard was like an 1100, like 1100 AD. So he's like, would the crossbow have been invented? And ha absolutely it was. Apparently it was invented as early as 2000 BC. I mean, it's just like a bow that has something that allows it to stay drawn. So yeah. it doesn't seem like it would be. And it, it seems like something someone would invented. think of trying to do very early on after the bow was invented. 
7th to 5th century BC. Saul and was killed by a random arrow. Saul? Yeah. Oh, that's right. Or he was Yeah, he he was killed by a random arrow. I wonder if Richard the Lionheart is apocryphal. No, he was killed by himself. Sorry, he Saul Saul jumped on his own sword, but yeah, he was yeah, injured yeah. by an arrow. I don't think Saul is the character you would want to model your That's ideal true. king off of. That's true. Um, yeah, so like we're not going to take a page out of Saul's book. Mm. Plus, he killed himself. Yeah, that's pretty not Lionheartish. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's get into. Oh, do you have any fast facts before we get to the major fact? I sure do. So, the Purple Emperor lives in woodlands with plants with broad leaves, and uh, lives all across Europe and all the way east to China. So it lives in the uh, uh, all above the equator in the eastern hemisphere. Um, females spend most of their lives in the tree canopy. They uh, like oak for the most part, uh, woodlands with oaks in them, um, and densely populated with oak trees. They only come down from the tree canopy to lay eggs. Um, and uh, males spend much of their time up in the tree canopies as well, but that is to defend their territory from other uh, male rivals. But they will come down uh, from the canopies to drink from puddles or feed um, because they fight so much, which is why I call them violet spar. Um, they lay their eggs on sallow leaves in the summer these eggs hatch into caterpillars with the horns um, soon afterwards and they spend most of their time on the mid rib of the leaf which is just the center line they eat at night um, and then when winter comes they actually hibernate so they go into like a top torpor state uh and they change their color to brown, like I said, so that they still blend in. If you look at a picture of the caterpillar, like it is very, very leaf-like. It's it, it's, it's camouflage is pretty spot on. Um, so it helps to turn brown when the leaf you're on turns brown. Um, then spring comes, and then the summer hits, and they build a cocoon. Uh, they spin a cocoon like m pretty much ever uh, most caterpillars do, and um, that cocoon looks just like a, a leaf that's kind of hanging off the edge. So again, with the uh, um, with the ruse with the rusco emperor rusco, um, and then they uh, they emerge. They don the emperor's new clothes, and they are a beautiful butterfly. And I will leave it at that because uh, I don't want to talk too much about what they eat. Well, let's get into the major fact that I'm calling Purple Putrid Eater. <laughs> too so, wide. Too horned. Because it's a... It, and as a caterpillar, it has two horns. True. Flying it, Purple Putrid Eater. That's, that works. The Purple Emperor... Butterfly differ, differs from other butterflies in that it does not obtain its nourishment from flowers and nectar. You know, the 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 typical butterfly fashion of being just these graceful, beautiful things sipping on sugar juice from a nice flower. No, no, no. Instead, uh, it's drawn to more pungent flavors including honeydew secreted from aphids. I looked up what honey... We've talked about this before, but I looked up like, what is that stuff? What's it for? And apparently it's like when the aphid like puts its mouth parts and breaks into like a vein of sap in a leaf or a tree or so, or in bark or something. I like all of these words. Go on. The liquid shoots up into its proboscis mm -hmm. and the pressure makes it like just ooze out of 
like an orifice on the other side. So it's like a pre- depressurizing valve. That I I don't want to go too top shelf with this, but I have to say that's probably the best sentence you've ever said. <laughs> Which part did you like? Um, something I liked veins. Uh, I liked um, orifice. That was a, that was a particularly <laughs> good part of the sentence. Yeah, yeah. Um, mouth parts was a great way to open it. <laughs> so uh, bravo. So they like to eat the um, the liquid that shoots through an aphid. Um, but they also will eat sap oozing from oak trees. That's kind of like their main. St- thing what you mentioned is uh they 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 hang a lot hang out in trees so they're eating a lot of sap but they'll also eat dung urine and animal carcasses with a hard left turn there sap is is uh is just such a butterfly thing to eat those other things are not it does like it's it's basically akin to the sugar water in nectar. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no. Poo-poo and urine and animal carcasses. That's not what you want. But it's what they want. Um, it's something of a mystery why these butterflies have diets more like house flies. But unlike flies, purple emperors have long tongue-like proboscises. Like other butterflies. Rather than the short straw-like tubes that a, a fly has. So when it finds its rotten meal, it will dab the long yellow tongue onto it, collecting nasty, moist nutrients. Now that was a sentence they, they, This is just getting better and better. <laughs> this, I like the sequel. Yeah, we'll see if this is a good trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> Butterfly watchers and photographers in the UK are avid hunters of a glimpse are of they, the purple feces eaters. Are they aphid hunters? Uh, no, not quite. Um, they call the males his majesty out of reverence. Oh, my god. Because goodness. He's, he is an... Uh, uh, they are British, are, and they are drawn to are those just giving pronouns? homage to uh, monarchs. And it is an emperor. So the purple purple emperors are naturally elusive and spend most of their time high up in the canopy canopies, like you said, uh, getting drunk on sap and fighting in in fighting with other males, as emperors are wont to do. Yeah. However, they will descend if they detect a pungent prize to eat. So photographers will bait the ground with all kinds of succulent meals, including shrimp paste, dirty diapers. Dead fish, stinky cheese, old banana peels, and dog poop. The idea of handling and hauling a dirty diaper into the woods (laughs) for any extended period of time is repugnant. What if possible. they bring bring the kids to like serve up fresh meals so they don't have to do that? That makes a little bit more sense. <laughs> you brought your kid on a nature walk and you have to change them and you're just like, well, might as well chuck this into the middle of the trail and hope a butterfly eats it. <laughs> well, just imagine, but like imagine being like somebody who loves catching a glimpse of these butterflies. Maybe you're a nature photographer. At least when you're changing your one millionth diaper you're thinking like this will serve some good. I mean, I can make something of this. It's a little consolation. Yeah, I guess it's like a it's a bit of a silver lining <laughs> which you need these diapers need silver linings heavens. <clears throat> they get worse so, and worse every year. Some observers even collect roadkill to make a pleasing tribute to the emperor. People have their own concoctions that they swear by, similar to fishermen with their favorite bait. Um, For instance, some claim that the best butterfly attractor is urine-soaked fox urine or fox feces. Urine-soaked urine? 
You yeah, so, it's, well, it's a, a delicate process. <laughs> but urine soaked fox feces, which seems like a challenging thing to find like while you're already trying to find a challenging to find butterfly. It's like I'm gonna get up early in the morning and hunt the wilderness for a fox's trail. Yeah, but what if you've already got a, a fox on hand? Then like then you keep all, a fox. Then all your troubles are over. The butterflies also seem to like sweat, so they'll land on observers themselves. See, that sounds like the way to go, because then you get to have a Disney princess moment all alongside it. True. So, why would you handle a dirty diaper even for one second when you didn't have to? When you could just like do Pilates and one will land on your nose. Well, I think the apparently like this, the fish paste I mentioned, the shrimp paste, there's like particular brands. People are like, this is the brand. You have to bring this. It stinks so bad, but you got to bring it. Um, so it may be the stinkier, the better. Uh, as with many animals that eat weird things like, the, like deer that chomp down on unsuspecting and trusting birds. Um, <laughs> we talked about that before, right? There's like this video of, uh, of bur- of deer, just a bird, like you know, basically straight out of a Disney Disney movie, a bird hopping around, a deer who's grazing in a field, and then the deer just kind of like happens to see, seems to like decide on the fly, like I think I'm gonna eat this bird. <laughs> I've never seen this before, uh, or heard of so, it. So, as with other like animals that eat weird things like that, like a deer that's not normally supposed to eat meat. Uh, the butterflies might be supplementing their normal diets with salt and minerals uh, that they don't get from high sugar oak sap. So like the deer that is probably supplementing for low calcium when they eat a bird and devour its bones. Um, <laughs> the the, That's the butterflies this are the- supplementing. Yeah. I bet you it's... If you made a movie about it, it would have to be the uh, what is it, the w- Chinese water deer with its vampire fangs. With fangs, yeah. Uh, there are many minerals uh, available in feces and rotting flesh that aren't in sugary saps, so the insects may associate powerful scents with special supplementary meals and flock to them while they have the chance. So the, in a normal, natural setting, they might just be flocking to the feces and dead things. But then people find that, oh, this stinky cheese kind of works because it sort of smells like it stinks really bad. And the uh, the butterflies are none the wiser. So they're like, oh, okay, I'm going to go eat that. I don't really have a lot of uh, discretion. I just eat things that stink. I guess if you're fighting all day and you need to rehydrate, it's good to get some salt in you. You're fighting and drinking all day? Give them yeah. Gatorade. It's got a lot of electrolytes. True. Yeah. I My preferred method, I guess, will still be sweat. Because that's easy to come by and does not involve handling uh, a dirty diaper for one fraction of a nanosecond longer than I have to. Yeah, but like you're going to feel like a real idiot when you aren't catch, capturing any photos of butterflies and everyone else on the trail is hurling their kids feces at them and getting all the pictures they want or or hear me out what if i'm the one that has a butterfly land on i get butterfly kisses on my nose because i did i was doing jumping jacks in the middle of a european forest and they're the ones that squatting next to <laughs> squatting next to a pile of their kids' feces with no butterflies to show for it. That's the, even more foolish. Uh, that's the worst case scenario, really. It's a really high risk, high reward. Yeah, if I mean the reward is the same either way. But no, no, the reward is, reward is not the same because remember again, butterfly kisses on the nose. Um, I guess for you versus butterflies over there on that diaper, and then and then what are you going to do? Take a picture of it? (laughs) That's the one thing I don't understand. It's like that doesn't go getting uh, literally a crappy picture. That doesn't go in Nat Geo. (laughs) 
I put it on some cheese. At least cheese looks okay for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not going to get like a cheese wedge into Nagio either. What maybe they cover it with leaves. So it just looks like a beautiful butterfly pretty pile much, of leaves. Yeah, it pretty much it has to land on your eyelashes in order for it to be a good picture. That's the only way to take a good picture of a butterfly these days. They probably have a purple emperor at Butterfly Garden on Sample Road, so just go there. Could be. Could be. But that's all I got. All right. Well, that was the... It was the Purple Emperor. And that was uh, disgusting. Uh, so for you out there in Podcastia, shed your leafy youth. Don your royal purple robes. And remember that roadkill is a veritable smorgasbord. Like the Purple Emperor here in life, death, and taxonomy. Hey Taxonomy Titans, I just want to remind you that we now have a Patreon. Patrons can see full video episodes and get shoutouts on the show. But ultimately, it's a way for you to help us cover some costs and get even better. Still, reviews are the best way to help us grow. So if you haven't left one yet, we'd really love to hear from you. As always, thanks for listening and engaging. podcast <laughs> imagine scraping up some poor woodland creature from the road on your way up to uh visit some butterflies it's like oh the butterflies will love this one